This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay, thank you, Ray. Um, as I said, my name is Andreas. I'm working at the uh, German Aerospace Center in, in Cologne. Um, it's also a branch in Berlin and other sites. And I'm working at the Department for Intelligent Systems. And I'm talking now about science and um, how to do reproducible science. And I start with a little like example. Um, this was a simulation in the field of aerospace design that we did a couple of years ago. We wanted to, to build, we have built a workflow with several simulation tools and they have been run on the, on the Linux cluster. And everything was fine on the, on the left side. The simulation one, very, very good on an HPC cluster. And then somebody wanted to reproduce this, this same computation with the same codes and with the same um, input parameters and so on. And what that ha then happened is that the simulation failed at, at some point. Um, on an HPC system, on a huge cluster, this is a lot of money that is lost. And so the problem, we wanted to find out what happened. And Actually, the, the solution was, I, I, we implemented this solution, which I explain later, but the, um, the finding that we got is that one of the system administrators changed the Linux library, and he didn't tell anybody. Yeah? And so the scientists started their codes again with the same settings and the same input files, and the simulation crashed. So what's then interesting is that you are able to be to reproduce the things you are, you are doing as a scientist. So, like, for that, you have a lot of technologies. Um, a lot of have to do, do with, with, with the term open, like open source codes, and um, things that you have to do code reviews with your codes, that you have a repository for your codes, not only for the source code, but also maybe for executables and other stuff that you, if you write publications as a scientist, that you also publish your source code, where you produce your results. You also have to capture, or you should capture, your computational environment, which is more easy today than in like 20 years ago with technologies like Docker or so, container technologies. It's good if you define like workflows for the things that you're simulating and that you use like open formats, open specification for data formats, that you have a proper data management and maybe in some settings that you're using a laboratory notebook electronically. And one thing um, where I'm going to talk about is provenance. This is like a technology for gathering information about all the processes that you are doing. And the definition of provenance is um, provenance is information about all things, all entities, activities, and people who are producing something. It can be a piece of data or a physical thing or so. And to afterwards then make assessments about quality and reliability, trust, and so on. This is a term and the definition by the W3C working group on provenance. Uh, they came up with a standard for that, for describing this kind of information. It's called PROF. Um, it's like a standard data format for, um, for storing provenance information for, for data and information um, in different formats. And the key concept of this, of this standard, oops. Um, the key concept of this standard is you have like entities. This is the first term, this is like a physical thing or a digital thing, like a, a file or something, or it can be a document, a website, data sets. Um, then you have, this is the thing that we, where we are interested about, interested in, like entities, like the, the result file. We want to know the history, how this file has been produced. And usually things like files are produced by certain activities, like um, algorithms and so on, or, or workflows. Um, Activities as, uh, uh, generate new ent entities and they, they use existing entities. And we have agents. Agents is like the human, the scientist, or other people, or agents can also be organizations or 
pieces of software or so on. And these key concepts um, are mapped together in a data model. You can see here like the entity, activity and agent and another uh, um, important concept here is that you have um, relations between these elements. Like for example, um, a relation used, like an activity used an entity. That means a piece of a line of code or something or, or an algorithm used a file for something. And an entity was generated by an activity. It means like a file or a result set was generated by some algorithms. And in the top right corner was derived from relation, like one entity was derived from another entity, like one file, like a result file from simulation was derived by the input file with the input parameters of the simulation and so on. And we have an agent like the, the human who is controlling the workflow or the experiment and so on. And um, <coughs> he's related to the entity with the attributed to relation, that means the, the, the file in this example belongs to a certain human or a certain kind of organization. And this is like a data model and like an example for a provenance graph is this. Um, usually you read um, the graph from the bottom to the top. So at the bottom, so you can have, to, you can act, see it as a kind of timeline from the top to the bottom. Um, in, the, in the bottom you see the end result, like in this case it's, it's a graphics file with some values and they were produced by an activity like a Python method, matplotlib plot, and this matplotlib plot um, method um, used the data set weights in this example and, and so on. And you can go upwards and at the beginning the input was like a database with some values. So in this sense you can like have a graph of all the things that you have to been done in your, in your kind of workflow or in your work. And this kind of technology can be applied to like any kind of um, application. Um, a very famous example in this kind of setting is like producing wine. And also it's used in the, in, in the arts section because a piece of art is only very value it has high value if you know the exact provenance of a piece of art. Um, if there's uh, something missing in between in this graph, the value goes down, like at an auction or so. Um, okay, so and to actually like store this kind of thing, usually you have your workflow or your application with input and with data results, and then usually you, you store this provenance data in a provenance store, and this can be um, or this is actually doing one time of the process. And um, this is kind of similar to other concepts like logging, but logging is very different because logging has no relations between different elements, different actors. Um, sometimes they call it lineage or there are other terms for that. And um, for storing you can use things like relational databases of course and query the things with SQL or use XML, RDF, or graph databases. And also you can use um, services for that with APIs. For example, there's like, for just playing around a public service with an API from the University of Southampton, a prof store, you can go to the website and just like enter your provenance information there, it doesn't make sense, but you, they have on, also an API where you can send provenance information to. And the website is very nice, it can um, visualize your provenance data and maybe you can see it. Uh, that I wanted to. Yeah, like this is a document, this is the provenance data from a simple workflow um, in textual representation. Yeah, we cannot read it, but it doesn't matter. You can go to the website. And uh, you can also like generate the, um, the graphical res representations in various fam formats and so on. It's very nice to store something. Um, <coughs> well, actually, what we are doing is because provenance is a graph, a directed acyclic graph. I mean, there are no, no cycles in that. It's like a um, it's moving on in time and there's no stepping back. Yeah, you cannot 
generate the input file of something by the output file. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make sense. And so the provenance information is like you can map it to a, a DAG. Um, and so naturally, I would say, you store graphs in the graph database. I mean, you can store it in other databases too. Many people do so. But we are using graph databases like Neo4j, Titan, ArrowNodeDB or so. And queries and this stuff with the typical graph querying languages, um, Cypher or Gremlin or GraphQL. <coughs> for example, for Neo4j that we are using also in production settings, um, it's an open source database implemented in Java. So um, unfortunately, it's not in Python, but maybe it's, it's OK in this case. Um, and it generally stores property graphs. Um, graphs, directed or undirected, um, together with properties. So each node, and each, each relation, um, can have additional properties. And also provenance graphs have properties, additional like kind of meta information or so. And also like, um, like the term meta information, um, maybe you know metadata for documents and, and files and so. And you can see like provenance information as a metadata for processes. Yeah. Um, okay, but how to gather provenance? And we must move on to go to Python now. Um, <clears throat> How to gather the provenance information from your application depends, of course, very much on your application. What kind of tools you're using, what kind of programming languages or other languages. And for Python, there exist a couple of libraries for supporting that, and there are also like a couple of tools that you can use. Just This is just the kind of tools that I'm using as an example now. For example, there's a Python library prof from the University of Southampton. Um, I mean, that's very natural. You just, um, there's the concept of a provenance document where you're storing, this is like a container where you're storing your provenance graph, and then you're filling this document. There's some entities, in this, in this simple example from the prof tutorial, it's about an, art, an article on a website. Um, you have an agent, in this, this example, he's called Bob, and they attributed um, to each other and so on and so on. And you can, you can write this down in Python and generate the provenance information and then go on and visualize this kind of stuff and it looks like this. Like the provenance of this HTML article at the bottom which well, was generated by some kind of zip file with, with some data. So very easy. Another example, oh that's on Python notebook, can you see it? It's um, it doesn't yeah. I mean the same as in the previous example. Um, in practice, you usually would add namespaces. Um, you add you give meta information for the for the agent. This is like yeah. It seems like my private email, but don't care. Um, you, you add your entities, um, and then in this real example, you you do real stuff, and not just um, the provenance things. And you're also adding entities, and so on, and so on, and so on. And what you're usually doing is, if you are if you are doing something like um, plotting some plotting a graph, to the end, add the provenance information after that, and then. Um, you can see the provenance information as text, and you can see the provenance of this example as a graph. Um, very, very simple. Um, and you can also go like, um, no, this was, uh, yeah, I move on. You can also go to the prof store, as I said before, and view it online or use some other service. And another example is um, that we have an, that's developed at DR and an interface to for storing these provenance graphs in in a Neo4j data database, and there you go and store the provenance document maybe from the previous example just within the database, and it's also rank very straightforward. Um, you have the provenance graph, and it um, looks 
like this in the standard visualization of Neo4j, for example. Um, you can go there, and um, where's Neo4j? Neo4j. Neo4j database, uh, it comes with an, well, with an quite good web interface where you can do like visualizations, um, for example, um, generate all the contents of, it, of the database with a simple um, cipher query in this case, and, and you can inspect your graph how it's, um, in the form it's stored in the, in, the, in the graph database. But of course, then you can go on um, and do queries on the data in the graph database, as with any other example. So this is an example um, which, what was it? Um, <coughs> very simple. The simple question is um, which kind of, or what software agents have been used to produce your end result data? This is like a graphic, and I want to know how, what software agents um, contributed to producing this data at the end. Make a query, and the result is like, like two pieces of software. It's like very small, you cannot read the full name, but it's, it's like down here. And um, of course, you can then go on and do, for larger graphs, much more complicated queries, depending on your questions and your concerns and so on. It's a very powerful tool to introspect the work that you have been done in the past. Um, and we have also a deal of real use cases, which is actually um, well, hard to talk about because we are not allowed to show pictures. We use it with industry, for example, in public final project with a huge manufacturing company in Munich. And we stored the provenance information of their, of their development process. And then um, something happened, like their engine um, switched off during a flight. So, and they, <laughs> they used the provenance information to, to try to find the bug in their development process. And it, it, it worked. So actually they found the process in their, in their development department and changed something that they didn't tell us. And, uh, I didn't know about any other um, planes which go down because of this. Ah, okay, and so it's, um, yeah. Another, another example is if you don't want to add like the provenance recording statements in your, in your code manually, which is quite similar to logging um, on the programming side, you can also lose um, tools which are available, like no workflow is a tool. Uh, where you can start just the, your own, um, your own um, Python file with, some, with this no workflow environment, and then it records all the provenance for you. For example, this is a graph with the different input files that you have in your repository or in your uh, project directory, and you have at the end an output file, and you can go to this graph and analyze how this, graph, how this data has been produced. Or another example for um, the side of, in the world of the software development, because very, the real strength comes from the prof, doc, from the prof standard if you're applying this standard to different fields or applications. For example, you can also um, build the prof graph of your software development process. And there's, for example, an, an service on, from a Belgium, Belgium um, university where you can just uh, enter your URL of your Git repository and then build the provenance graph of your Git repository. Well, actually, this is, in theory, this is quite nice. In practice, this is really not, I mean, it's hard to go into the visualization. It's really hard to understand, and it only makes sense if you analyze it by tools or so. Um, <clears throat> or another example, which is also important for scientists, is there's also a prof style file for LaTeX, um, where you can like add also a kind of provenance information in your LaTeX code, and then it also generates, if you are doing the LaTeX compiled stuff, it generates a provenance document, a provenance graph for your, um, for your document, which also has the provenance information for images and so on. Yeah. And a topic where we are really using this as DLR is uh, electronic laboratory notebooks. If people are doing planning experiments and executing experiments and simulations and 
analyzing data producing results. We have like um, a provenance model for that and we can record the provenance and then make queries. For example, the question who worked on experiment X, for example, if you just want to, to do, if you want to have the name of the scientist who worked on this experiment, this is a, also a very simple graph query. In this case, this is, this, the syntax is gremlin in this case, because this is currently still being used in production at DRA. And um, a nice use case for this is um, if you are at the end, after your simulations and the experiments, producing a paper, um, usually um, you should like make an archive out of it. Um, and what we can do is let's select the, the PDF document, like this is your final paper is the name. We select it, say make an archive out of it with all the data which contributes to this paper. That means all the images, all the input files for simulations, all the experimental data, and all other stuff related to LaTeX and so on. And this is also automatically gathered using the provenance information. And only the stuff that contributes to the paper is used and nothing else. It's very convenient. And um, so in this application, the users won't see anything about provenance or um, provenance graphs or weird in visualizations and so on. They just have a zip file at the end. So my time is almost over. Um, what we are currently doing at DLR in this kind of topic is um, we are writing a new prof library in Python because the existing stuff has some shortcomings with connectors for different graph databases. Neo4j is great, but it could be faster, that's our impression. And we want to use like, or t actually test uh, ArangoDB with also MPIs in REST and ZeroMQ and MQTT for things like um, Internet of Things applications. We also work on trusted provenance um, by storing provenance data in blockchain databases. And we try to do provenance for people. That means the graphs that you've seen are not understandable by most people. We try to visualize them in other forms. For example, one of my master's students is working on generating comic strips out of the province data, where you can see a comic strip of your life. It's really, really nice. So, thank you. And I don't know if you have time for questions. Yes, we do have time for questions, but first we have time for a little applause. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the question is about um, workflow tools like Luigi or other tools. Um, the proper way would be to integrate the provenance recording into these tools. And there are workflow tools from the scientific domain which also have currently have provenance recording. Which is then these. I mean, that would be the natural point that these tools would have um, like support for storing the provenance information. Some do but some are do not in a standardized format. And as I said, the real power would be if you use a standardized format for that. Um, also in the workflow tools, yes, the question is, could the tools have an extension? Yeah, it depends on the architecture of the tool. I mean, if, if you can, I mean, there are tools out there in the world where you can, can't add extensions. And others, and others you can, and it depends very much on the tool. I mean, this is a, it's not really difficult, but it's a very technical field, how to integrate provenance recording into your tools or your workflows and all your stuff, yeah. Any other question? Otherwise, you can approach me outside at the coffee, so. It seems there are no more questions, so again, thank you very much. Thanks.